This is the brand new Nothing Phone 2, and this is Carl Pei, the guy who made it. This is a rare opportunity to learn about not just what this phone is and the thought behind each decision, but also to really understand the secretive way that the world of smartphone building works. So I'm going to make sure we get all of that insight and then a couple of curveball questions at the end. So just to catch you up, Nothing released their first phone this time last year. It was a £399 mid-ranger with really unique design. Mm -hmm. I've actually got one right here. It sold pretty well by the sounds of it. Almost 800,000 units. Across the world. Across the world. How is that versus your expectation? That was our expectation. Bang on. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, he's run a company before. And now, the Nothing Phone 2. So this is the package you get. It's very thin, it's very streamlined, it's very different. You have to peel off this tab on the side to get in, which I don't love, it kind of destroys the packaging. But then inside what's cool is you can tell Nothing has spent the time to craft the experience. You get some manuals that almost look like apples, a SIM ejector tool, which is completely clear, and the same goes for the USB-C cable. I like this. It's really cool to see a bit of personality across the accessories too. And then the phone to itself comes in white, which is in this box, and grey instead of the black which the last phone one came in, which I think is a good decision. Lighter colours tend to be better at hiding fingerprints. First question on my mind, this is a big, big departure in terms of price, right? Mm. First phone released at £399 in the UK, this is 579 I mean, in my mind, when I see a series of phones, it feels like most companies have kind of decided what they are and they stick to it. Mm -hmm. Whereas you've gone up 45% in price. What's that about? The first year when we built our um, previous device, it was a very different time for us as a company. Our team was very small. Reaching for a flagship wouldn't really be realistic in terms of our capabilities. But we always knew that the second one would be a more premium experience. So you were just warming up with Fan 1? We're always warming up. There's a <laughs> long roadmap ahead of us. This is actually a good segue to talk about the design itself. So this is arguably what's put the Nothing Phone on the map, right? And you've taken it up a step further with this phone. In what ways would you say it's better? The Glyph interface was quite limited in the Phone 1. But that wasn't because we didn't have a vision of where, where to take it. It was more that we didn't really have the resources yeah. to build those features. So I would say for the phone too, the Glyph interface gets much closer to that original vision. We wanted to enable people to be more focused on where they are in their daily lives, people they're interacting with instead of always being on the screen. That's actually really important to me personally. I've set up all sorts of mechanisms on my phone recently to stop myself getting lost in apps because they are getting better and better at hooking you. But there is still a question on my mind. Because while it was pretty cool that the Nothing Phone 1 could use its glyph interface to be a flashlight and show you your battery percentage while charging, it never to me felt like more than just a party trick. So what makes this not a gimmick? The hardware part is not what makes it better necessarily, but it's mm. the fusion of the hardware and the software. And mm. uh, for Phone 1 users out there who are watching, you will also get a lot of these features. I would say some of the top features for the Glyph interface is one, this Glyph, we made it into like a segmented Glyph. So it doesn't just have an on and off, it can show progress. We built support for some third-party apps, especially food delivery and ride hailing apps, so that when you're ordering these uh, services, you can see how close it is to you without checking your screen. I've already become the kind of person who sticks my iPhone like this, but actually doing that while knowing that, okay, my Uber Eats order is here is pretty cool. We created something called Essential Glyph Notifications for the apps that are truly important to you. You can make this light as an example to stay on persistently. I really, really like that. I think this is a super interesting tool to help you organize your life. I'm just imagining setting up my own Nothing Phone too, picking just a few contacts and types of notifications that I would deem important enough to make this flash and therefore demand that I check my phone, as opposed to giving every notification that power over me. Also, side note on the design, the fact that the back glass now curves all around is an A plus move. It stops it feeling like an iPhone clone, like you could say the last one did, and legitimately makes it about eight times more comfortable to hold. You kind of integrated this same design philosophy into the way the phone works as well with Phone 2, right? We're thinking about how apps have kind of hijacked the entire smartphone experience. 2008, the App Store was launched. It felt like a lot of people just went to focus on how to build apps were really sticky. So how do you maximize the amount of time spent on each right. app? Right, yeah. So you can sell more ads or sell more data. And a lot of the smart people in the world were working on that. Meanwhile, the mobile OS itself kind of let it happen because, you know, the big tech platforms also make money mm -hmm. together with app developers. We want to start making apps a bit weaker. We built this monochrome 
design language. It's actually really funny that this is a feature because on my own iPhone, I've actually set a triple tap to do that oh, exact thing. Yeah. <laughs> and that's basically your home screen. So when you set the phone 2 up, you actually get a choice between setting the home screen as default Android, which is bright and colorful or Nothing's own skin that focuses on being a bit bland and not distracting. I'm a big fan of the Nothing Phone concept of giving you back power over your apps and removing the app labels. But until I've properly used it myself, it's really hard to say if that's going to make your phone less engrossing or just make it harder to find your apps. So subscribe if you want to see my full review where we all go into all that stuff. You can take all your Android quick toggles hmm. and make them into widgets. Hmm. So if you can do more on your OS, on your home screen, you don't have to use the apps as much as mm. before. It sounds very trivial just having these widgets, but there's a next step and a next step in the evolution to keep making things more and more efficient. I will say initial impressions upon using this software are strong. It feels really fluid, which is to say it's smooth, but every phone nowadays is smooth, but it's smooth combined with all these tiny little animation choices that feel thoughtful. Like how double tapping the screen will lock the phone with an almost Looney Tunes-like animation that centers in on wherever you have double pressed. So in terms of the screen, you've gone from a 6.55 inch 700 nit peak brightness display to a 6.7 inch with a 1600 nit peak brightness. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Which is an enormous jump in brightness. The mm. main reason for this uh, jump in screen is that it's a much more flagship level display. For me, the most interesting thing is LTPO. So meaning we can um, dynamically change the refresh rate from one to uh, 120 hertz with uh, just one hertz increments. From the front, every phone has kind of felt like it looks the same for the last five years. Do you feel like phones are getting boring. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we started this company. On the hardware side, we're nearing a very mature state mm. of the smartphone form factor. If we're really going to innovate, it has to happen in uh, software services and maybe in alternative form factors. How would you say this screen ranks to other phones on the market? I think it's a big improvement to the Phone 1 screen. It's 1080p still in terms of resolution. Yeah. I think that's fine. I, I still use every phone where I get the option still on 1080p and I'm above average in terms of how much I would care about those things, mm -hmm. but I still just cannot tell the difference. I really like the fact that you've stuck with these symmetrical bezels. It feels like a really tiny thing to have like a slightly thicker bezel at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And I can see why most companies are like, oh, it's fine, no one's gonna notice. But it really bothers me when that's not the case. We had many fierce debates internally. There were two camps. Actually, if we didn't go for symmetrical bezels, we could have made the side bezels even slimmer. So you could have technically increased the screen to body ratio further, Yeah. but you wanted symmetry. Yeah. I rate that. Product choices. <laughs> okay, let's talk about cameras. So the phone one had 250 megapixel cameras. This also has 250 mm -hmm. megapixel cameras. Am I right in thinking the main camera has been upgraded? That's correct. So on the hardware side, we opted for a slightly better sensor for the mm -hmm. main camera. So this one had the Sony IMX766, and this is the 890. That's so. correct. But I think most of the improvement is actually on the software side and the tuning side. What Carl says is that because the phone 2 comes with a more powerful chip than the phone 1 did, more on that in a minute, when you take a photo here, it can feel Use together multiple full quality raw images to get the final output, as opposed to what most phones do, which is fuse together a bunch of compressed JPEG images to get the final output. So why is it that you guys opted to not go down the let's get a massive sensor in this phone route? It's got a lot of design consequences. Mm. Like one of the reasons why a lot of phones are starting to look similar again, having these round camera modules is because they want to hide the really big one inch sensors, but I don't think it's worth it. Now this, I disagree with. For me personally, I don't think big cameras look bad or come at the cost of design. If anything, they make your phone look more capable and therefore cool. And I mean, the way I'm looking at it, even if there was a situation where the camera quality did come at the cost of design, I still think the priority should always be function over form. But then again, that's just the way that nothing is positioning themselves. They're kind of a design-led brand. So you think camera hardware is mattering less and less? You're saying the improvements are like 90% software and that's why I think it's a bit interesting to partner up with legacy camera brands because mm. they're all hardware companies or lens or sensor companies. Like Zeiss. Yeah, but they don't really have any know-how to help you improve a tiny smartphone camera. Okay, so yeah, you're, you're quite far away from sticking like Hasselblad next to it. Unless they build a really strong AI team. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So this phone's using the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1. It's a flagship chip, but it's from last year. How did you come to that decision? Uh, I think w when we make product decisions, it's always about the user benefit, the cost versus the performance, or not just performance, but also things like heating and battery life. So we found that this is like the optimal processor for us to use in a phone at this price point. Also, we don't really want to be the first to use 
with new platforms. We prefer to use something more stable and reliable. So the battery life has gone up. So it was 4,500 on the Nothing Phone 1. Now it's 4,700 milliamp hours on the 2. Mm -hmm. What was the reason for that change? We just wanted to deliver a better user experience. Um, the Phone 1 would last a day. Hmm. Um, sometimes if your day was a bit longer, you would have battery anxiety towards the end. With the Phone 2, we just wanted to eliminate that. Like For me, I've had days where I haven't charged my phone for two days. Okay. And it's still kind of okay. Kind of okay, so alive after two still days. Still alive. I'm, I'm not a heavy user. Do you use the front or the back? <laughs> Both. <laughs> Both. This thing charges in about 55 minutes is the quoting mm -hmm. charge. Is that zero to 100? Yeah. The Phone 1's maximum uh, charging was 30 watts. Uh-huh. And this one makes so 45, right? One thing. Yeah. How important is charging speed in a phone? It's important, but you don't have to go crazy. Your battery degrades faster if you use that kind of um, high ampere mm. charging. But you feel like it's negligible up until you get past about 80 watts. Yeah, probably 60. 60 is probably the ideal. So then I guess the big question is nothing phone 2. Who is this phone for? What kind of user is going to be buying this? I think first and foremost, uh, forget about all the design, forget about all the differentiation. We have to build a really solid phone because mm -hmm. a phone is not a toy. Like there might be really serious situations in which you need to contact somebody, mm. like the police, for instance. So it just has to work. I know the divide between iOS and Android is getting bigger and bigger for consumers. So I think people who are familiar with Android or who are curious about trying Android. Now this is a really solid phone. Do, do you see it as a bridge for people who like Android to use, but like iPhone as a status slash design symbol? We see uh, about 10% of our users in that cohort. Mm. Like they like good design, but they haven't been able to find an Android brand with a design ethos they can Accept. How do you see this versus an iPhone? In a lot of your sort of launch events and stuff, you reference Apple a lot, maybe even more so than other Android companies, right? I think the iPhone is a really solid phone. It's like a, almost like a no-brainer recommendation mm. if your friend is not that techy. Is it because it's the majority, like because it's the best-selling phone? It's the majority. Everybody knows how to use it. There's no mm. education. It's kind of like... Uh, how Windows was back in the day. Is it accurate to say that like nothing would want to be something like that for Android? I think we should take inspiration from the early Apple, mm. like the Apple of our childhood. Yeah. Almost kind of like magical with a lot of unique ideas, trying to push the user experience forward, trying to make products that are better and better. What would you say is the biggest challenge when building this phone? Today, if you want to build a smartphone, you probably need 200 to $300 million in working capital. It's because if you think about the last 10 years, there's been a couple of teams that that's tried to create um, smartphones and they've all failed. I mean, you don't need to do much digging to find examples of this. Like Red, the camera company who tried to make their own smartphone, which failed catastrophically. Hmm. And when they failed, they also made their suppliers lose a lot of money. The suppliers were all really friendly before. Hmm. They were like, okay, we'll build your product and then you know, just pay us 30 days after we deliver the goods to you. Today it's like, you say you can sell phones, right? Pay us two months in advance of mm. uh, delivering products. So you need a lot of money because you need to pay them before you even get the product to sell. Presumably a lot of your job is actually convincing consumers, yes, this is a great phone, but also convincing suppliers, this they're gonna really like this, trust us. Yeah, it's just <laughs> gonna do volumes. And it was really tough for the, for the phone one. We had to pay people about two months mm. before getting the product. Wow. Um, normally you pay two months after getting yeah. the product. So in a sense, our gap was four months, right? Like a cash gap mm. compared to the bigger guys. And then we got really high pricing, like about 15% higher than everybody else. And then we had a very small team in terms of engineering, software, to deliver a, like mm. a really stellar product. You can see why there's very few successful entrants into so, the market. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes people email me like, hey, I want to make a phone. Can you help me? It's like, please don't. Yeah. <laughs> don't do it. OK, so I wanted to finish with a quick lightning round. You ready? Sure. Yeah. OK. What is your most used app? Email. That <laughs> took you a while. Yeah. Dark mode or light mode? Dark. What was your first smartphone? First smartphone was the Motorola A780. First Android phone was a G1. G1. T-Mobile G1. Wow. That's the first Android phone. Incredible. Oh yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> I imported it into Europe and I locked it. 
What would you say is your average screen time in a day? Uh, probably two and a half hours. If you had to use a Samsung or a Xiaomi, which would you pick? Samsung. Great hardware, great software, and not investing in logos. So YouTubers have started doing this thing where when they start to have beef with someone, they get in a boxing ring and they have a boxing match. Mm. If this situation were to ever arise for tech CEOs, would you do it? I've seen that uh, Mark Zuckerberg has gotten really fit, so probably not him. <laughs> <laughs> um, and a sub to the channel would be? Mm. Wait. <laughs> you could just say nothing. A sub to the channel would mean everything. Beautiful. To me. I love it. <laughs>